I'd like to start with my presentation, which is called The Man Who Didn't Know He Had a Brand. There's going to be some, some slides which have a little more text material. Don't, don't worry about that. That's for you when you get a copy of the speech to have some of the things I'll be saying to you. But everything that's important, I'll be talking about. And you can just roll with the images. And you know, if, if you want to snap photos, that's fine. But you'll get a copy of the entire speech with these details on there. But what I wanted to address today was some retail insights. And I've put them into a chain, which comes to a conclusion at the end. So they're kind of like four short stories. And then we get to the plot. Yes, that's me. We don't need that. We're going to go straight to this gentleman. Meet William Phelps Eno. Not exactly a common recognized name, but if you were in the transport industry, this man was the Steve Jobs of transport at the turn of the century. This man single-handedly invented a number of the traffic regulations that are in place today. He invented things like the stop sign, pedestrian crosswalk, traffic circle, one-way street, taxi stand, and pedestrian safety islands. His work was so important that, and I, I need to underline this, it's not that, for example, Piccadilly Circus was designed by him. No, no. What happened was in the days that he lived, let me show you this. In the days when he was a young man, <laughs> there were cars on the same road with horse-drawn carriages on the same road with steam trolleys. So it was a mess. You know, there were traffic jams, horrible things everywhere. And this man invented things like the stop sign. <laughs> Seems <laughs> elemental, but somebody had to invent it. And if you're one of the people that are still getting tickets for running stop signs, you owe that legacy to William Eno. He said in his autobiography, which was a bestseller in some historic time. He said in his autobiography, you know, I got into this because as a young man, I, I went out with the family. We were going to have a great day, and we had this most horrible experience stuck in traffic. And as a young man, I felt deprived. I felt, really, this is out of control, and somebody should do something about it. Now. The reason why I've brought this in is because a lot of high-paid consultants are, are convinced that industries should learn from other industries. And they get paid a lot, of, a lot of money for this, so I'm hoping this will increase my hourly rate by dragging in another industry. But the point of this particular story comes to this point. The man who's most instrumental in all the traffic regulations never learned how to drive a car. Didn't have a license. You know, his, his contribution, which changed the shape of the transport industry, came from the fact that he was a customer. He was what we would call in our parlance a user. <laughs> He had a bad experience, and from that customer experience, he went out and he changed the friggin' industry. Going, I'm not going to put up with this. This is the experience we want. And a lot of his contributions were stop here, go there, let's all go in a single file, things that were perhaps common sense, but nobody put them down and nobody put them in place. As this customer, and his customer experience, he changed the entire industry. That's my first story. My second story is in a different part of the world. It's about an entirely different person. And this man, meet Abol Fazl Kanyani. 
This is not his real picture. I'm sorry, there's no picture available, but this man wanted to have a business. He set out to find a market. He had 40 workers in a small Iranian factory, diligently making products outside of Tehran. But unfortunately, he chose the industry of flag making. Not exactly a revolutionary business, but he started off at it, and at first he wasn't that good. I mean, he's learning how to do it himself, so he's making flags that are, you know, okay, but they're, you know, they're not the toppest quality, but his business grew. His customers loved him, and the product and the sales grew, and his company became very successful. And then he found out who his customers were and why they bought the product. He actually didn't know this at first. He just knew he was making products, putting them into market, and he thought for a good price, a reasonable quality product. What's wrong with that? And his customers built a brand going, wow, we're going to go to this protest. You know, if you go to the protest, you got to have a flag. You know, and the flag you got to get is, is you, know, you know, from Kanjani. You got to get a Kanjani flag for this. This is the best one. Suits the purpose, suits the price. And, you know, he's, from the interviews I've read with him, he's a very nice man, and, he, and he's going, gee, I, I wish my products were used as gifts. <laughs> he said, but, but they're not, and I can't control what the end user does with my product. But on the other hand, I'm very grateful, you know, for the amount of business that I'm getting. And, you know, again, I'm American, I'm not promoting flag burning, but even if you're from New York, you appreciate the commercialization of what's going on here. <laughs> you know, how cool is it to build this type of product and have the support of people who are very loyal to your brand? So in this scenario, the customers defined his brand. He didn't set out to do this. Go, I'm going to make the best flag for flag burning in the country. I'm going to be number one and dominate this market. He set out to make a product, and his customers go, oh, this is good over here. This is what it's good for. And he rolled with it. Soon he was making Israeli flags. He was making any flag where anybody had a passion for. The customers defined his business. My next story moves to a different continent and different people and a different sort of mentality. And you may or may not have heard of Beta. Beta comes from a guy. There's a couple partners. I'm going to mention Philip Robb because he seems strikes me as the intellectual force behind it. But Philip Robb started in Gap. He didn't start in our industry. But he was hired away when Nintendo wanted someone to help launch and build the Wii platform. So he joined Wii. He was there for the great explosion of that Nintendo product and platform as the director of retail marketing. From that experience, he was hired as the director of global channel for Nest. You know, the, the real fancy um, thermostat that's gotten a lot of attention and you know, has been acquired since. But Phil Robb said to himself, as this man with a great retail experience, not a retailer himself, but a great retail experience, he said to himself, you know, people, vendors, are there vendors in the room? Good, we're vendor free. Vendors are normally <laughs> missing the boat on a lot of things. <laughs> And Philip Robb thought to himself, the vendors are missing the boat totally with this. What we really need is a new model. We need a new type of retail. And we need a type of retail where we provide all the experiential stuff that customers should have. And then we invite the retailers to come in and use our expertise, because obviously they don't know what the hell they're doing. Philip Robb has now 45,000 square foot. They're working 
on small retail outlets, about 5,000 square foot. They have more than 1,000 brands and more than 50 million product engagements. The reason we can tell you how many product engagements they have is the number one selling point of their approach with the vendors is that their small retail outlets are experiential and are geared to the gills with sensors and technology. So any vendor that goes to them goes to them because beta can tell you exactly what's happening at retail with your product. They can tell you when people look at your product, how long they look at your product, whether they actually you know, get to the hands-on point. They can tell you whether or not people have expressed an interest, and they can actually take orders via online in the store for the product. The store itself is a little Apple-ish, if I can turn Apple into, a, into an adjective instead of a noun. And they, um, they have um, very successfully launched in the market. They have a very high reputation amongst the vendors, and now they're going international. So their first store outside of America has just opened in Dubai at the end of last year. And overall, that gives them 25 outlets. It's a growing concern. And 3 million visitors, which as they grow more and more visitors, this data collection that they specialize in becomes more and more important to vendors. This Dubai partnership you know, is quite exciting for us because it means Europe is not too far away. You know, maybe at the end of next year we'll start to see beta here in Europe. But from the point of view of retail expertise, this is the most exciting thing since Apple opened their outlets. This is the outlet that retailers in other industries are looking at to gain insight in how maybe they can improve their relationship and vendors in the store. We would have to define this as retail as a service. Retail as a service. The vendors pay money to come in and play. They invented their own technology to drive these outlets. The technology was called ARC. They've now launched the ARC Marketplace. And this means that their platform, their data-driven information platform designed for retail, and these stores, I, I might add, they, they carry a lot of electronics, but they do carry some other product categories. But then again, doesn't Best Buy today? If you go in the Best Buy, you're liable to find all sorts of stuff that are not necessarily what we would see as consumer electronics, consumer IT. But I think Best Buy and Beta have come to the conclusion that you know, their role is to provide what the people that come in the stores might want. And they're not going to limit it to just to consumer or consumer electronics, because that would be an artificial limitation on their business. If you go to the CES show in America, you'll see that everything under the sun now is considered part of the consumer electronics show, and these retailers are following the same formula. Their sort of argument, they show charts on why you should leave the retail to them, but the important thing is this art marketplace is also a platform as a service. And any retailer or company that would like to subscribe to this platform to drive their business, you would be able to, to take it as a service, which might be interesting for someone in the audience. I'm not naming names. Someone in the audience. My next retail insight I want to share comes from our industry. But those of you who are older, stick with me here. What's the first thing you think of when you hear a monster cable? Now, 
monster cable is uh, famous for a lot of things, you know, not just their products, but they used to hold private rock concerts at CES, invitation only events where Sting would sing or uh, Tina Turner would come in. So the, the company was always associated with, with audio artists because of the nature of its business in cables. They very famous you know, for their work with Dr. Dre and Beats, which we'll get into in a minute. And the owner is quite a dynamic individual and someone who, when he was young, used to, I used to travel Europe with him, helping him set up his distribution. Noel Lee is considered, if you've been in this industry long enough, as the man who invented the accessories category. If you're selling accessories, you owe a little bit of legacy history to this man because he was the first person who came along in the world of audio at the time, which was the mother before video, the mother of consumer electronics. He was the first person to come along and say, gee, you know, we got all this crappy stuff that we're using to hook up all the nice stuff, and we should upgrade and spend time and trouble. Noel Lee invented not just premium cable, but he invented a lot of the technology on the merchandising of how to present accessories, at what point, the point of purchase displays, you know, uh, one of the first you know, to be using video. He was very much of a merchandising guru, and companies like Best Buy depended upon Noel Lee to show them how to do things. And, um, for 40 years, this man dominated this premium cable business with the Monster brand and was famous enough and profitable enough so one of the giant sports stadiums in California was then named Monster Park with Noel Lee being the sponsor. And as stories go, Noel met the perfect opportunity. Here he is, king of cable, well-known in accessories. He's got all these relationships with musical artists because he's been paying them to come to parties, paying them to uh, make records with him, paying him to promote cable. And he meets Jimmy Iovine and Dr. Dre. They come to Noel through a friend and they go, we've got this crazy idea. You know? Dr. Dre is such a perfectionist in music, he has such a reputation, we'd like to make a loudspeaker and you know, use Dr. Dre as the driving force. And Noel Lee thought about this and went, who needs another loudspeaker? <laughs> this is crazy. <laughs> yeah. And he pointed them in the direction of headphones. And they created a brand between them called Beats by Dr. Dre. You probably know it. Beats is a very famous headphone premium brand now. But at the time, at the time, these gentlemen from the music industry thought, well, you know, we don't know much about this, you know, so they signed a five-year contract with Noah Lee saying, help us with the design, help us with the merchandising, help us bring it to market, help us use your distribution channels. And Noel Lee, via actually his, his son, you know, uh, decided to embark on this. And when they did this, at the time, Apple was selling $400 iPads with $1 earphones, earbuds. <laughs> and the first product that Noel Lee put out cost $350 as premium headphones. Nobody had seen this before. And between Noel Lee's merchandising, his channel, his reputation in the business, and between Dr. Dre and Jimmy Iovine getting all the artists to, to show up with these headphones and sports stars on the basketball courts while they're waiting, running the, you know, having the Beats headphones, this created for this industry an entire new market of high-end headphones which a lot of people have enjoyed 
a taste of that. All of this due to Noel Lee and this combination with the music industry. But the head monster, Noel Lee, had finally met bigger monsters. <laughs> I'm giving you this short version of the story because the lawsuits are hundreds and hundreds of pages, but essentially, they launched this business. It reached a billion dollars of sales under the monster house. And Dr. Dre and Jimmy Ovine, being from the record industry, which is a very tough industry, an industry that is not particularly known for loyalty, they came to Noel Lee and said, thanks for your help, five-year contract's over, bye-bye, don't let the door hit you on the way out. And, I mean, you can imagine it was a little bit of a shock, and, you know, he had no real ability to do anything because the contract was up. And weeks later, these music industry guys took in a big investment from HTC in China, and gave HT China the rights to produce the product and took off on their own. Noel Lee <laughs> was left holding a bag of a billion dollar infrastructure with people, stuff, and had to dramatically cut back and at the same time probably made a few bad judgment calls on how to react. But the fact was that after be, you know, after Jimmy Ovine and Dr. Dre sold a part of the company to HTC to make the transition, then these guys were sharp enough and ruthless enough to turn around and say, well, the partnership's not working out, we'll buy it back from you, they buy it back, and a couple months later, we're selling to Apple <laughs> for big bucks. <laughs> So HTC got screwed, Noel Lee got screwed, but Jimmy Ovine and Dr. Dre made, you know, a billion and a half each out of the deal. I'm telling you this story, and I'm, I'm giving you the short version because there's a lot of details in it, but Monster's business dropped at a monster rate. They tried suing, but, you know, the contract said quite clearly at the end of five years that people could walk away. And, you know, as much as it might be heartless <laughs> if the guy has done you this favor of building this business, I'm showing you this picture because the guy with his arm around Noel Lee, like Best Buddy, that's the president of Best Buy. These, ra these music industry guys didn't have access to the distribution to make this happen. Noel Lee's contribution, you know, no matter that the contract doesn't take that into consideration, they would not have arrived at the billion dollar destination without Noel Lee's reputation, his contacts, his ability to go to Best Buy. Best Buy at the time, Noel Lee went to him with Beats, Best Buy was making $2 million a year profit off Monster Cable products. That's why he's got his arm around Noel Lee. You know, $2 million a year of profit from one single vendor. And that's why it's an unfortunate circumstance that the contract allowed these guys from the music industry to kind of rape, pillage, and plunder here. And Monster crashed. Now, not every company is eternal, so Monster crashing, you know, this happens from time to time. But a 40-year run at the top of your game is probably about as good as it gets in our industry. But Noel Lee <laughs> is a hard man to keep down. And so now his company has really been pretty much eradicated, squashed, flattened. Noel has put his personal money back in to Monster as a company and said, look, you know, they may have killed this, but on the other hand, over 40 years I have built this brand, and that brand has a lot of value and a lot of people 
that respect it because as retailers and distributors, they made a lot of money off of it. So his new business today is licensing the Monster brand to companies in the consumer electronics industry that might need it or in some other industries. And he already has eight licensees and he has 200 trademarks, URLs. He was known to be a bit of a tough guy because, for example, when the job site monster.com started, Noel sued him and actually won some money because Noel owns Monster brand. And the conclusion of the Monster story is that if you build a brand and you maintain it and you dominate and you put it into the mentality, it's a very hard thing to kill. They don't die. They stay around, they have value for people, and they come back. My last vignette, this is in Harajuku in Tokyo. Galaxy has opened a store, a very beautiful building, six floors, very modern, fancy designers, and is set in the part of Tokyo where they have a lot of young, hip millennials. The front of the building is decorated with more than 1,000 smartphones facing outwards. I hope they don't have a SIM card in each of those. <laughs> and inside, they have a gorgeous experiential retail store. And this is like their classroom where you can take a painting class, digital painting. This is, of course, a cafe where they have a barista and they have food and stuff where people can kick back. This is an area where people can touch product, but I also want to mention this store has a dedicated customer area for repairs. And they actually produce their own smartphone cases originally inside that store. And they have one floor, well actually two floors, dedicated to interactive installations that can you know, help people get engaged with the product. Um, they have booths, they have VR, they have cameras, all of this around the smartphone. Now, many of you probably have already realized that Galaxy is actually Samsung. But in Japan, there's a cultural issue, and they had to drop Samsung four years ago, and they focused on the Galaxy brand in Japan. So here you have a vendor with a world-class brand, but they can't really use it the way they want, so they have to go back to the wallet, spend again, and build a new brand, and the brand is Galaxy. And this process of a brand making another brand is probably a lot easier because once you know how to do this, how to make a brand experience, then it becomes quite easier along the way. So I've given you some vignettes. Now I want to tie it all together here. So I talked to you about William Enno. This man changed his industry via his experience as a customer. Abol Fazl, his customer's experience defined his brand. Philip Robb, he built his business as an experiential retail of service, and it is currently considered state-of-the-art retail. Noel Lee, otherwise known as the head monster, built an enduring brand that has suffered more than, if you Google it today, all you get is lawsuits, controversy, arguments. But this brand has endured more than any brand should ever have to endure, and yet is still standing. So 
my point this morning, and I hope at Distry that we'll have a lot of opportunities to discuss this, but I feel we're not working hard enough, not working fast enough on customer experience. I think we hear the words experience, I think we hear the words experiential, but I don't think we get it fully. I think sometimes we get confused between you know, the, uh, the you know, forward-facing customer portal or you know, uh, how easy it is for someone to pay at the cash register. I don't think we understand what retail and what distributors have to do to support retail now down to even the smallest retailers. It's going to be all about experiential selling and that experiential selling is the experience of the customer, not your experience. It's the customer and you heard, I think, you know, uh, some of the market research people have told you this, you know, here that the customers value the experience more than the product itself. And we've got to get creative and we've got to provide new types of experiences in our outlets. We've got to break out of the mindset and hopefully some of my stories today have helped you take a look at that. Brand has to be at the center of everything we do. Now, a lot of us as retailers and distributors, we think brand, we think vendor. Okay, but the vendor is only one part of the job. This goes down to the point of where you as a retailer, your brand, you as a distributor, your brand, and even you personally, I would argue, as a brand, this brand experience is the link to survival in the future for our industry. I'm very much convinced of that, and I want to thank you for listening to me this morning on that. Thank you very much.